live on our last lesson for Christmas messages for the new year. Literally the last day. I guess it's the fifth Sunday. No fifth Sunday singing. But um, the last, our last day of the year as we begin or end a new year or end a old year, begin a new year. We're talking about the fear knots of Christmas. As we are in Luke, and I am not going to read both chapters. I'm going to read excerpts from it. But uh, we are in Luke chapters 1 and 2 as we conclude this little section of some Christmas lessons uh, as we're moving that. And then next week we will begin some study in angels. I think people will be see what the Bible says about angels. And we'll begin next week with angel mania. But we'll talk about fear nots after we open with prayer. Father, we just thank you for the privilege it is as we come to the end of our year that we can be in your house and your people. We thank you for the, each one who's here today, those who've taken time to come and celebrate and worship you this week. We thank you for those who participated in Miss Mildred's funeral this week, the songs, the words, and everybody as we celebrated her life. And we pray that we would continue to carry forth the legacy that she's established here as today in Sunday school and in morning service. We ask that you guide us and direct us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Fear, the fear knots. Our nation seems to feel more anxious with every passing year. The number two, the top two things that people seem to worry about over the last couple of years are high medical bills and terrorism. Go, Matt, go figure. And it, fear is not a discriminatory of socioeconomic class because it affects the rich and the famous and the less rich. Uh, the well-to-do all have what we call phobias. Now, we all have some type of phobias, I guess. Napoleon Bonaparte, who conquered most of Europe during his time period, was crippled through his, out his life by a fear of cats. Go figure. Guy at the handy house out said, don't you want a kitten? I've got a 10 left old kitten I'm going to give away if you want. I said, well, I've got a puppy. He might not appreciate it, but I'll pass the word on. Anybody wants a kitten, go to the handy house. They've got a cute little kitten. Uh, the fear of kitten or cats is called allurophobia. Queen Elizabeth I wrestled with what we call anthophobia, the fear of flowers. Julie, you're out of a job. You had that. Uh, Sigmund Freud, who was the uh, famous father of psychoanalysis, suffered from what they call agoraphobia, fear of open spaces in the uh, marketplace. Edgar Allan Poe was something that probably a lot of people have, claustrophobia. I have that. Don't hold me down. <laughs> Donald Trump's afraid of shaking hands. It's called chirophobia. Howard Hughes was victimized by mysophobia, which was the spread of germs. Andre Agassi, the tennis player, has one, the fear of spiders. James says he has that, called arachnophobia. And John Madden, the great NFL coach and announcement, was aviophobia, the afraid of flying. I've got Several close friends of mine that have that have costed me long driving trips because they wouldn't take a flight. But that won't happen anymore. They can meet us, they can leave early, we can meet us down there. So all I tell us all this kind of tongue in cheek is that the world's full of fears. And of course, stress seems to reach its point during this time period between Thanksgiving and New Year's and the holidays. Psychologists and counselors report that it's the busiest season of the year. Uh, and you seem to be a lot of people that end up in hospitals and sickness due to phobias and fears during this time of year. Well, uh, fear was... I share this because this is funny. The funniest fear that I ever heard a word for is called anaphobia, and it's the fear that somewhere in the world a duck is watching you. The fear a duck is watching you. <laughs> well... <laughs> I mean, that's a real fear. Hey, uh, there's face. fears out there. Uh, Dr. Jeremiah in his commentary said there was a fear out there, the fear of a long sermon. Amen. So, if we can find that word, we'll tell Bob that today. He said, hey, our, a lot of us are suffering from that. By the way, I remember the day that I had my little fainting special. I had a couple of people approach and said, hey, by the way, we're sorry you passed out, but hey, it got us out of church early. <laughs> so go figure. But anyway, no, we don't want to be there because you'd be there till what, 2, 2.30, 3 o'clock. But all tongue in cheeks. Uh, fear was uh, a present at the very first Christmas time period. On three different occasions, in the readings that we celebrate this time of year, 
uh, people were told to fear not, to use to calm the fright of the participants during that time period. For instance, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Zacharias, this godly man, quote, was troubled and fear fell upon him, Luke tells us. But when the angel Gabriel suddenly appeared uh, later on to, in Mary's presence, she was also unsettled by his words, Gabriel said. It says, what manner of greeting this was. And of course, we know the shepherds were greatly afraid. So fear was involved in the early Christmas time periods. And certainly fear will take us or attack us in the uh, year as we start new, fresh and new. But um, because of that first Christmas when God come in, in, in the stage in the, in his ba- as a baby, excuse me, I'll get my words out here in a minute, uh, there's really no longer fear. And I was reading the other day that if you have faith, that it's a sin to live, be anxious and fear. Now, you know, some anxiety is fine because it's given to us, but to live in a state of current fear and anxiety is a sin and a violation of the Word of God because you're not living by faith in Him. I've tried to take it at the heart when things come at me, but hey, easier said than done because fear comes upon us very easily. But we're going to see there are three truths to remember uh, when we begin to feel the sense of fear coming on us. Number one, God still answers prayers. We'll read a little bit from Luke 1, 5 through 14. Uh, as I said, I'll read some of not the whole chapter. It is in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of the incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. There's that fear. But the angel said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have glory and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. And that is the word of God for the people of God. You know, the history of that lesson there was he was a priest and each priest had a certain time period where they would have a chance to go in and minister into the holy area. And it was his chosen time and he's only alone in there. And when he goes in there, an angel appears to him. Now, that would be kind of shocking if you think about it. If you were, even if you're here at church at night sometimes, maybe cleaning or doing something, it's kind of eerie to be here alone. How about if all of a sudden somebody appeared to you and began to speak to you? probably would start to kick up a little bit. He was in there and certainly also remember they hadn't had any word of God for over 400 years during the silent periods between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so as Zechariah was in doing his thing in the uh, priesthood, all of a sudden the angel appeared to him and the angel knew he was afraid and he began to tell him, fear not. So maybe we've been praying about something and it seems that hey, maybe... God's not listening or answering. Perhaps we get discouraged. We've lost loved ones. We've seen sickness problems that come upon us. And we say, well, I'm going to quit praying. God doesn't seem to be answering. But if God answered Zacharias and Elizabeth's persistent prayer, the entire life they had lived, she wanted a baby. He was a priest, for goodness sakes, and hadn't had any children. So they'd been praying for all these years and hadn't had an answered to prayer. Sometimes God answers prayer in His own timing and in His own way. And the Lord loves to take delight when we learn to pour out our heart to Him. And the Psalms are filled with that. The fears, the fears that are happening on those. But you know, as a result of the first Christmas, we have something that happens. That Jesus came to live among us, put on flesh. And Hebrews tells us in response to that, that hey, seeing then that we have a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but was at all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. So the angels appeared to Zacharias and said, hey, don't be afraid. 
you're going to have a son and he's going to be one of the great people. Jesus said to a man born a woman that was greater than John the Baptist and he'd be the forerunner of the Messiah. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Because God is going to answer your prayer. And so we have the promise today that when we are afraid, we can go to God and can pray to Him because Jesus, who is God, lived among us. He's faced the fears that we face, the sicknesses, the jug on our heads that when we can't hear, our throat gets scratchy, we feel bad. We just feel blah. Or I ain't never been so hungry. I, got, I wish he'd hurry up so I can go, go eat at ribeyes or somewhere. He's faced all those things and he understands that we have the promise that we're afraid. We can go to him and pray and ask him whatever we wish. This quote by Mary Crowley is one of those that's funny. She said, every evening I turn my worries over to God. He's going to be up all night anyway. So, you know, when we get anxious and we, you know, we lay there and we can't sleep for us, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do with this? We can learn that we can bring those worries to God because why? He still answers prayer. Scripture says God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because He answers prayer in the past, we just got through studying Genesis and all the prayers that Abraham made and Isaac made and Jacob made and Joseph and all the children of Israel, Noah, through the years. He was the same then. He's the same during the New Testament times and certainly today is we can go uh, to the Lord and prayer. We have no longer to fear because we have Jesus who dwelt among us and understands and he still answers prayer. The second thing that we can come to fruition with is when we begin to face fears for the new year, God answers prayers, but also he keeps his promises. Luke 1, 26 to 31, he begins to tell us, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled. There's that fear again at the sand and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now, once again, we put that into context. Young girl, an angel appears to her. I remember the movie that came out. She was kind of out in the wilderness, and all of a sudden, this angel appeared to her and began to speak to her. Certainly, as with Zachariah, would probably get our attention if an angel appeared to us and began to speak to us. Sometimes it's kind of freaky. If it's just a person comes up, if an angel, we can understand but, you know, seven centuries earlier than when this promise was made to Mary, there was a promise made to Isaiah. Uh, and it hadn't been fulfilled for 700 years. We only waited like 400 years from words spoken to Zacharias. But only 700 years, the angel had appeared or given the word of God to Isaiah. And now God has given an answer to a promise to Isaiah some 700 years later. In fact, over in Matthew's gospel, he makes reference to that promise. And he said, it come, all come together in the person of Mary. And she said, and she shall bring, this is Isaiah's prophecy, Matthew quoted Isaiah. And she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus and he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So in the same way that God had not forgotten his promise to the Israelites, to the Jewish people, to the chosen people, that a Messiah was going to come to save his people, and it would come through a virgin, the promises that he's made to us. But how many, somebody said there was a promise for every day of the year, if you read your Bible. Uh, I read there was more than that promises in the Bible that God made. So if he's made promises that came in the past, those promises that we hold on today, certainly we can bank on. God doesn't lie. He doesn't change. And what He said He will do and He will keep His promise. One of my favorite ones is where He says, I will never leave or forsake you. Or as Terry's one that she's, I've never seen the righteous break it, begging bread. All those promises that we read that we hold on to, we know that when fear begins to try to choke us and grab us, we can say, hey, God has a, has a promise and He keeps His promises and He answers the prayers we make. So 
when we get to feeling fr afraid and a scared, as we say. <laughs> Hadn't seen that license plate every once in a while that says, I ain't scared, it used to be on the back of people's concern that we would say. When we begin to feel that way, we realize that God keeps his promises. And we have a whole Bible full of them that we can say, God, you said this, and I want to put my faith in you that you'll keep it. Well, the third thing that God is God still has a purpose. He answers prayer. He has, He keeps his promises. But he still has a promise. That With that, we'll turn over to Luke 2 and read a couple of verses from that. This is from verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were what? Filled with great fear. There was another fear. And what has the angel said to them? Fear not. So this is the third time we've had fear. God responds with fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David his Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this, this will be a sign for you. We'll find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, and lying in a manger. And suddenly is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from the heavens, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And when they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. So, once again, another fear and another answer to fear God sends, this time to the angels, to Zacharias, to Mary, and now to the shepherds. And what was the purpose of God in all of this? What's his mission statement that he was trying to do? You and me and our salvation. That's the whole meaning uh, for Christmas. Someone has once said, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, He would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, He would have sent us an economist. And if our greatest need had been pleasure, He would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, and thus He sent us a Savior. So that's the purpose that we celebrate at Christmas. The fear that we had of being lost and never being fine in our way. And God said, I'm sending you a Savior, and He came to form as a baby. So we can relax in the knowledge and know that God loves us. And I say that because I love that book that I read. It changed the way I see everything. That He's always loved us and He always will love us. And so God's purpose has never changed since He wrote the Gospels and to the, and to the Old Testament. And it's times that He made His first announcements to the shepherds. And He said, I don't want you to be afraid. I am replacing your fears with joy, a joy that was so joyous to them they couldn't keep it to themselves they took off and headed took off and went to Bethlehem they didn't have a car to get in or a plane which they didn't need to go that far but still they had to take a little while to get there they ran with haste to see because they were so excited because their fears had been done away with so when Zacharias' speech returned after the birth of Jesus remember he couldn't speak because he kind of laughed You're going to have a baby he said, I'm an old man. And he said, well, you ain't going to be able to speak until the child comes. And for some of y'all, that might be half if your spouse or your better half couldn't speak for a while. Probably good to my house because I speak and talk too much. But uh, when his speech returned after the child, what did he do? He began to praise God publicly. Mary, after she had been given the fun, wondrous word of God that she was going to have it, couldn't contain the joy. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. So Zacharias had had a, his, uh, Lord, his promise fulfilled to him, his prayer answer, excuse me, and he couldn't contain himself. He began to be joyous and gave the, his Zacharias benedictus, I think is the fancy Latin word for it. And then Mary was so excited, overfilled with joy, that she gave her magnificent. And she says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in my Savior. For he has done mighty things. Of course, the shepherds, what they do, began to return and glorify it and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard was told him. So God had answered prayer, had fulfilled promises and kept his purposes. You know, and George Morrison, who's one of the great writers, had wrote this little bit. I'm going to read this because I can't. Put it in language that I need to read it. He says, you know, we don't associate fear with Bethlehem. 
you know, Christmas time, we read, we, it's more of excitement. We associate Bethlehem with joy and singing and with the spring up of glad and hope. We like the candles and hope and joy and all those things. The Christmas hymns that we sing are among the gladdest hymns to be found in all of our Christian music. You think about the sing, the songs that we sing are exciting and happy and joyous. Even desolate, lonely people are conscious of a kind of inward warmth at Christmas time. And yet, these shepherds out on the hillside were terrified and terribly afraid. They were not careless or irreligious men. Eastern shepherds were very rarely that. Yet when the angel of the Lord appeared to these hardy men, they were not just afraid, but terribly afraid. And though their trust as simple, faithful shepherds was in the God of Abraham and Isaac, an awful dread fell upon their hearts. They were afraid out in the middle of nowhere. Think about the shepherds and put them over here for a little bit on this screen. And let's go visit another occasion when an angel appeared to someone. And this is a great spill in the next week's lesson because we're going to spend the next month studying angels and what's going on with angels in the Bible. What they do, what they do at death, what they do in Jesus' life. And let's visit another occasion when an angel appeared to someone. We'll fast forward to the grave of Jesus where a young lady was visiting. Her name was Mary Magdalene. Now the interesting thing is, is when we come to Mary Magdalene, there's not a trace of that command in fear or terror. The shepherds were afraid. Zacharias was afraid. But Mary was not afraid that day. And yet, fear was in the shepherd's heart. And we would think that it would be intensified with her early in the morning at a grave where her Lord was laying. She was a delicate, shrinking woman. They were hardy, courageous men out in the middle of nowhere. But she, and she was all by herself in the early morning. They were out in the hills. She was in the presence of a graveyard. Yet, as I said, there's not a trace of Mary ever feeling or expressing any fear when the angel confronted her. She didn't run away. She didn't faint and pass out or fall down. <clears throat> the angel spoke to Mary, and Mary answered the angels as if she were talking for some friend from the village. You couldn't imagine the shepherds doing that night. They were quaking as we sing in silent night. What made the difference between Mary and the shepherds? The difference lies in Mary's love for Jesus, a love which the shepherds were quite ignorant at the time. They knew of a Messiah coming, but hadn't experienced. Guess what? Mary had lived three and a half years, maybe less, maybe more, with Jesus and understood who Jesus was. So we say the love that she had for Jesus banished the fear that she had of the angel at that point. And we all know Scripture tells us that love banishes fear. The Apostle John, who we got to study, tells us there's no fear in love. And the love of Jesus had so mastered Mary that fear took itself to wings and fled away. I love that quote. It was a fearful thing to be out in the dawn beside a grave near these Roman soldiers that we forget were there. It was a fearful thing within the sepulcher to be confronted with angels. But just as mother love drives out fear when a beloved baby is born, so the love of Jesus drove out the fear in Mary. I never thought about it from that point of view. You see, the difference between Mary and the shepherds is that Mary knew Jesus and loved him. And to have known him and to have loved him and have to have been certain of his love for her destroyed all the fear that for anybody that she could have ever had. A woman with a woman's heart, she was stronger than those hardy shepherds because Christ was living with her and his love was living him within her. So what do we say to banish haunting and fears that come upon us? Like the fear of a quacking duck, as Terry said. <laughs> we would... <laughs> no, Terry's got to bring comic relief to us, doesn't she? So to banish that kind of haunting and fears takes more than just being courageous. People say, ah, be courageous about it. No one would change, charge those shepherds for being cowards. They would have laid down their lives for those sheep in a moment. But amid familiar and expected dangers, they were equal to the problem. But let something mysterious and unseen like a quacking duck happen, fear began to take over. It's like when we, we fear the future and we fear things that don't come upon us. No natural courage could ever keep that bay at bay. But we know that when the love of Christ comes to live in the heart, 
perfect love casteth out fear. And so one thing we know is that neither height nor depth nor life nor death can separate us from the love of Christ. In that love giveth and returneth lies the dismissal of a thousand fears, end quote by George Morris. So we often say the opposite of fear is courage, but the opposite of fear is love, Scripture tells us. So the more we read and the more we learn about Jesus and then express our love to Him and from Him and then read the Bible like the love letter that it is to us, we begin to learn to deal with the fears that will come at us. And certainly as we begin to turn the page to a new year in the, tonight, I guess not in the morning, fears will come away in the new year. Fears of health and sickness and finances and things that are coming. When they come to us, we remember, we go to the love letter and go with the promises that he's made, the prayers that we pray and the purposes he has for us and allow ourselves to get caught up in who he is the Savior of the world. And when the fingers of, I love this quote, when the fingers of fear start to clutch at us, remember those three things. God still answers prayers. He keeps His promises and He keeps His purposes. And that purpose can be consolidated into one verse for Christmas that I'm going to read. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Father, thank you for bringing us through the Christmas season, through ups and downs and discouragement and encouragement and happiness and loss. Through it all, we know that, as we said, you can come to you as the great high priest and you still answer prayer. Any prayer, if we don't ask, it can't be answered. We thank you for that. We thank you for the fact that uh, you keep your purposes. We know you have a purpose for us to make us more like your son. And we know that you answer all the prayers, keep our purposes, and do all the things you've called us to do. And we ask that you lead us as individuals and as a church as we go into the new year to bring others to a relationship with you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, knowing that you have always loved us and you always will.